All right. Uh, so moving on now in uh, Toynbee's study of history into the next sub chapter, which is that on uh, China in the history of uh, what he calls Sinic civilization from a Latin word, uh, Sine, meaning Chinese. So it's Sinic. And once again here, he makes the mistake of dividing it uh, into two separate societies, uh, the what he calls the Sinic civilization that comes into being from 1500 BC and then goes all the way down to the collapse of the Han in the third century and then it, uh, the Three Kingdoms period and then its reformation during the, uh, the period of the North and the South, which then comes to, into being around 500 AD. And so he calls China from that point on far Eastern and is still up and running. There's no reason whatsoever to divide the, these two societies, India and China, into two separate societies. It's not four societies that we're dealing with, it's two. Um, they're culturally distinct and consistent right down the line. And so he goes back looking for a universal state. Uh, although I do think this chapter is better than the Indian chapter, uh, it makes a little more sense um, without, just other than that division. So he's looking for a universal state. And of course, he finds the first universal state in China here uh, in the time of the great uh, emperor Qin Shi Huangdi and the Qin dynasty here from 221 to 206, which is followed by the Han dynasty 202 to 220 AD, which is basically a continuation of it. And we can see that this is uh, this is the first universal state in China. It is this corresponds to Spengler's Caesars. Spengler says that Qin Shi Huangdi uh, it was it definitely was the first Caesar, just as uh, Ashoka and his father had been the first Caesars in India at almost the same time, just a few decades earlier in the 260s BC. And so here we see in the purple outlines the extent, and here's the Great Wall of China, which was initially ascribed to the building of Qin Shi Huangdi, but there's a lot of evidence that it pre-existed him by quite a ways to keep out their external proletariats in the Gobi Desert and in Manchuria, the Shangnu barbarians. Um, and the, the purple is the extent of Qin Shi Huang, of the Qin, after which China is named, of course, uh, dynasty. And then the Han even extends it further into the south and off over here across the mountains into the Taklamakan Desert. Um, and then into North Korea. But notice a couple of things about this chart. Number one, they don't go into South Korea. That's interesting in view of the division between them today. They also don't have Taiwan yet, which they won't have until the 17th century under the Manchu or Qing uh, dynasty, when they took it from the 17th century to um, down to the Opium Wars, uh, whereupon the Japanese took it away from them. They're also, of course, not in Japan, although... Uh, Tony B says that uh, Japan represents a Far Eastern offshoot, which uh, later he says the same thing about Korea. Um, and this is probably true because I think if you deleted China from existence, let's say, Korea would cease to exist, Japan would cease to exist, Taiwan would cease to exist, and so forth. Not Vietnam, though, because this is colonized by the Indian Hindu civilization in Cambodia uh, with Angkor Wat and so forth. Uh, so that's a different, that's that's another cultural boundary. So this is a, cult, a Sinic cultural zone so that we can think of the, uh, the Korean Peninsula, Japan, and Taiwan, as well as Hainan, as essentially culturally, uh, speaking the same languages, basically, essentially culturally consistent with China, but not politically so. It, it took them a long, long time to move into these areas here, and they never went into Japan. Um so this, so I agree with this. This is the first universal state of China, which is followed by the Han and its breakup and so forth, um, and on and on down the line. And um, so let's take a look back then at the uh, earlier phase, which is the period of the Warring States, which is the time of troubles. And he says, by the way, that the universal church of this uh, of this universal state is Mahayana Buddhism which didn't come in with the Qin dynasty, but it did, it did come in around 200 BC with the, with the Han dynasty um, and spread across China, where it was attacked. And finally, in the 9th century BC, it was attacked uh, during the Tang dynasty. So here's 260 BC, and we can see the Qin barbarians over here are coming in from the hinterlands as universal states, very often, but not always, are founded by uh, external proletariats or uh, people who come in from the hinterlands, as Alexander the Great did, for instance, coming from the hinterlands to the north in Macedonia, um, as America is filling that role, coming in not from the, the, the homeland of the civilization in question, but from its periphery, 
the um, this is a point made by Carol Quigley in his book, The Evolution of Civilizations. So here's the chin moving in, and pretty soon they're going to uh, unify all of this. Um, and then so the period before that is the spring and autumn period, 771 to 476 BC. And we can see that it's it's even China is even smaller, hasn't gone into North Korea or any of these other outlying peripheries. So the, the area around the Yellow River is the core nucleus and origin of this society. And this, of course, too, is the time of Confucius and Lao Tzu, who live around 500 uh, BC. And um, Feng Yu Lan, in his History of Chinese Philosophy, which is excellent, by the way, for anyone interested in, in studying Chinese philosophy, it's, it's still the standard, and it's a classic, uh, refers to this period as the Hundred Schools period, right around 500 BC. Um, but we don't have a hundred schools left because of all the book burnings, especially the ones done under Qin Shi Huangdi, who was a legalist, which is a very cynical, anti-metaphysical philosophy. Um, we're lucky that Confucius's Analects and Lao Tzu's, uh, uh, Lao Tzu's uh, Dao De Jing survived that. Also, Mo Tzu and Chuang Tzu and a few others ha have survived. And Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche points out that... Um, so during that hundred schools period, it's evident that we've already got what Toynbee calls a time of troubles, because when you have that many thinkers, as Nietzsche says somewhere in one of his notebooks, a preponderance of mandarins in a society means that something has gone wrong. It's not a sign of health, actually. Uh, just as when you get sick, the intellect wakes up and it starts analyzing the body. What's wrong? What's wrong? Um, so the spring and autumn period is already a period that's clearly troubled. We have Confucius with his Analects. These are two responses to the challenge created by this social chaos. Confucius with his Analects, wherein he wants to go back to the Zhou period, the, especially the early Zhou period of filial piety and ancestor worship. Uh, and it's during the Zhou period, which lasts from about a thousand down to the down to the time of Qin Shi Huang. It overlaps this. Um, that is the longest and most stable period, about 790 years of Chinese civilization, corresponds to the Old Kingdom in Egypt, which lasted for a thousand years of stability. So Confucius wants to go back to that, but note that in a certain sense he corresponds to Spengler's Socratic man, that is to say the man of rationality who comes on stage during the Enlightenment phase of its philosophy here and preaches an empty a religion that is empty, like, let's say, Lessing's uh, religion of deism, where it's strictly rational, uh, and with Confucius, what we have, he wants to go back to upholding the rites, worshiping the gods, but he doesn't believe in the gods. So it's a kind of form of deism and is an equivalent to the West's deism, which is the period of the Socratic man over in the West with Voltaire and and uh, Lessing. So, and then Lao Tzu uh, responds to him, and Lao Tzu is very clearly the response to Confucius, he has him in mind and makes fun of the, the idea of Ren, Ren, the courtly man, the man who does all the proper rites and knows the court. Lao Tzu says, fuck that. I'm going out to the woods and I'm going to go back to an even older archaism, namely the Neolithic world of the, the Yang Shao farmers from the Neolithic. That's my ideal society, living in simple villages and huts. We communicate using knotted cords, <laughs> not even writing, inscribing uh, the Chinese writing on, on tortoise shells. Um, he wants to go back way before that with a metaphysics of the, of the Tao and following the Tao, uh, paying attention to nature, not civilization, which is, after all, worthless, degenerate, and corrupt because it's falling to pieces. Look at it. And uh, Toynbee also makes the comment that it's possible that Lao Tzu didn't even ever exist, that it was just a name invented, but that's, if you read the Tao Te Ching, that's, this, this guy is very cantankerous, grouchy, and moody. This is a real guy. There's, there's no question about it. Um, traditions don't have moods like that, uh, that, that have figures invented for them. Perhaps Orpheus was an invention assigned to the Orphic religion in Greece, maybe. Uh, but the Tao Te Ching is, is very much aimed at Confucius and, and dismisses all of his ideas about filial piety, ancestor worship, and going back to uh, the Zhou world. Uh, it, it's actually very funny, some of the comments that he makes. So then the Zhou period is before this. Here's its Wikipedia page. 1046 all the way down to 256, just prior to Chen Shi Wangdi coming in and 220 and unifying the place. Uh, the Zhou was very stable. 
And let's see, uh, then the Zhou period was then preceded by the Shang period. Uh, let's see, this is a good map of it here, which shows that its extent is even less than uh, in the time of Qin Shi Huangdi uh, and the Spring and Autumn period. Uh, Qin Shi Huangdi had gone into North Korea over here and incorporated elements far out into the deserts over here. Uh, so this is Shang civilization. In Japan, we just have the late Jomon culture at this time. Shang civilization is 15, 1600 BC, down to about 1,000. The Ainu peoples over here, whom the Japanese regard as barbaric because they have hair. <laughs> the Japanese don't like hairy people. Um, I wouldn't do well over there. I'm a pretty hairy guy. Uh, so this is all still Neolithic here, but the, but the Shang is up and running. It's sophisticated. Let's glance at some of its art here on the Wikipedia page. Um, so we get the earliest origins of Chinese writing. Then we get these wonderful bronze um, bronze vessels. And here we have, uh, looks like a, the, the famous Chinese tiger. So we'll see the tiger and the dragon alternating quite a bit. And these vessels are very important because in Shang society, people, the ones who own these vessels uh, usually are shamans performing rituals wherein... Uh, and wine is also drank in these rituals, wherein they can ascend, riding on the back of, of a dragon, or indeed on any one of these uh, shamanic animals, into the realm of the spirits to commune with the ancestors to get their blessings. So it was. Uh, so there were wars fought, just like in Tolkien, the, the, the wars fought of the ring. There were wars fought for possession of these wonderful vessels. Here we have a burial... Um, here's a tortoise shell with some very early Chinese writing on it, very uh, primitive, uh, undeveloped. Um, and this is a tomb during that period. Uh, here's another one of the shaman vessels. Now note two that I want to draw your attention to here about the iconography and the vessels. In the Shang dynasty, the animal iconography, this is probably another, uh, this one looks like a dragon to me, that is unified with the vessel itself, a lot of times these vessels carry wine or they, or they carry something, uh, incense perhaps, uh, that will be used to worship the gods and invoke uh, the two different souls, the Hun soul and the Po soul, which have to be united in the ritual in order to ascend and talk to the ancestors. Uh, but they will, the animal iconography will, in succeeding periods of Chinese art, they'll, they'll separate and the animals will go one way and the vessels will become strictly pragmatic and go the other way. Here they are perfectly united, whereas, um, this is one of my favorites, it's wonderful. There, there's a little guy that he's embracing right here, probably a shaman guy, uh, this tiger. Um, if we look at an even earlier period, the early Doe period, uh, which corresponds with a legendary dynasty called the Sha dynasty, X right here, XIA, um, that may have existed 1900 to 1500, and was further inland than, than the Shang. But archaeologists have found what they call this early Doe culture. Um, and let's take a look at some of its art here, which, which may actually be, because it's in about the right time and the right place where it's supposed to be, to be pre-Shang. And here's what the, the architecture might have looked like. Um, now note here that during the Sha, which is before the Shang, uh, the vessels, the tripod vessels, are, uh, and these are sacred vessels for wine, um, do not have animal iconography. The animal iconography is entirely separate in this art form, this art of these turquoise tiles. Here's a descending dragon. Uh, the art of these turquoise tiles. So the two were separate, and it's not until the Shang dynasty that the, the iconography and the vessels are fused together and they become very sought-after uh, objects. Uh, here's another one. Uh, and just as a side note here, just to point out, isn't it interesting how... Uh, how similar this art is to the art of the Olmecs across the water, where they also have, the, these are uh, serpentine uh, stone mosaics of a jaguar face, so that once we hum, hop, hop across the water, uh, the jaguar is swapped out for the the tiger um, in, uh, in the Olmec art. And I'm very strongly convinced that the Olmec world 1200 B.C., is affiliated, um, despite what Toynbee says, to Chinese civilization. So let's take a look back here. So that's the art of the Shang. Let's move forward and take a, a, a glance here at the art of the Zhou. Um, let's see. Uh, here's an early 
a painting on silk with a man riding a dragon. And very often the dead are described as ascending to the realm of the ancestors riding on the back of a dragon. Either that or they'll ride on the back of an animal going down into the underworld, the Yellow Springs. Um, and that's normally, riding on the back of a dragon is a metaphor for the, the shamanic trance flight. It's ascent to the realm of the ancestors. Here we have very early painting, a lacquerware painting from, from a, a Jung Men uh, tomb. Uh, about 700 BC, somewhere in there. The painting is just barely getting going. It takes a while for Chinese painting to get going. So here's one of those bronze vessels from the Shang period that's undergoing transformation, and the animals are leaving it. Notice that here. The animals are fleeing into an art of their own. Uh, let's see, coming up here. Um, right Here they are. So now the animals leave the bronze vessels, the, the Yu vessels and the Hu vessels, um, they leave it to become an art of their own, which is probably, my guess, is becoming secularized from the shamanic ancestor ritual cults and becoming an art in and of itself and unto itself. Let's see what we have for the art of the spring and autumn period then, which follows it. Um, and then let's see. This one's really interesting. This, this obviously, this uh, bronze tiger eating an animal with gold inlay is now purely a work of art, I believe. I don't think it has any con uh, connection at this point with uh, Chinese shamanism. And here the vessels are becoming uh, completely devoid of all the animal iconography. It's just not there anymore. Um, and so the vessels go one way and uh, the animal iconography goes another. All right then, let's see, there were a couple of, so then now look at the art now of the time of the Qin Dynasty, of the time of Qin Shi Huang Di, and this is an art, uh, it's a stone rubbing from the Han Dynasty, the dynasty that follows, of uh, depicting uh, Zheng Ke's assassination attempt on Qin Shi Huangdi, who is over here holding an imperial jade disc. A lot of these jade discs turn up in burials, like a superhero wielding some sort of a powerful weapon against the guy over here who's trying to assassinate him, who's being held apart by his physician and his attempt, the knife has landed into this pillar, almost like something out of the Dune movies. Um, so the painting here is still, it, it's still getting off and up and running. And here's a, a lovely, elegant uh, work of architecture from this time, 256 BC, during the Warring States period. So the architecture is now achieving its apogee. It's moving up into its great period. But the art now becomes imperialistic to a certain sense in a certain way, you could say that it's in decline, although, although it's really not because it's going to take off toward its equivalent to India's Gupta period and at about the same time, about uh, the 5th century AD. But it's it's sort of a, like a Roman imperial uh, art. Um, we get the famous soldiers uh, that are in the tomb of Qin Shi Huangdi, which has not been excavated and which the Chinese will never allow. Um, and rightly so. I think certain things should probably not be disturbed. Um, these uh, characters are from an outlying annex. Uh, I've forgotten what it's called, but they're, they're incredible. The, the sculpture here is absolutely amazing. It's kind of unmetaphysical, but then Chen Chi Wangdi was not inclined to, uh, toward metaphysics. And Chen Chi Wangdi is, in, in a certain respect, China's equivalent of, the, of Egypt's, the Pharaoh Akhenaten, because Chen Chi Wangdi came in totally disrespective of all the Chinese traditions. He dismissed filial piety and ancestor worship as a waste of time. Uh, the philosophy is very cynical, legalist, something that the Romans almost would come up with. Um, very empty, very shallow, very strict about surfaces. And he hit the society, and he, he reformed everything. He, he created new weights and measures, new coinage, a new form of writing. Buildings got taller. Um, it, it was very traumatic, and there are certain texts that depict Chen Shi Wangdi like a Godzilla figure, uh, this giant creature stamping across villages and towns over the land. Um, so this was very traumatic for the Chinese psyche in the same way that the Pharaoh Akhenaten came into Egypt and tried to eliminate all of its uh, funerary cults. Um, all right, so this is the imperialistic art of the time of Chen Shi Wangdi. And then so after the Han Dynasty um, is up and running until about 200 AD or so and comes apart, uh, China then disintegrates into the Three Kingdoms, which the great Chinese novel, The Three Kingdoms, is a romance uh, about. The, the Wei Kingdom, the Wu Kingdom, and the Shu Han Kingdom. 
uh, doesn't last very long. Um, and then it's followed by the Jin Dynasty, 266 AD to 420. And note that the area of, ex of its extent on up into the Taklamakan Desert is about the same as that of the Chin and the Han. So this isn't a different society here. This is the same society. Um, and I think, let's see where we're at here with Jin. And then uh, the culture really does make a comeback with the Northern and Southern Dynasties, 386 to 589, which is Toynbee's date then for drawing this as the birth of a new Chinese society, the Far Eastern Society. It's not. It's the same. Let's take a look at its art, which I think proves that. Um, Toynbee knew nothing about art. so And art is absolutely essential for understanding a culture's semiotics. You can't get anywhere without it. And the art now, during this period, the Northern and Southern Dynasties, is attaining its apogee. Look at this beautiful Kuan Yin statue, a sandstone uh, statue of the goddess of infinite mercy and compassion, which is the Chinese... Uh, Mahayana metaphysical equivalent of Mary. Uh, some Hindu uh, art depicts her with a, with a thousand arms. Her arms are reaching out and answering the prayers of those who pray to her, especially the souls of the dead who are in hell or in a form of hell. And uh, here's a Maitreya Buddha. Um, this is an elegant, beautiful, sophisticated art. Look at these, the wonderful detail on these statues, um, very likely of ancestors. Uh, the painting is now up and running and very confident of itself, um, starting to become luminous and uh, quite quite good. Um, so then, uh, then it moves on uh, and develops over the centuries. And then here, back to the animals. Now we see that the animals that went their separate way and they left the bronze bronze vessels, which went one way, the animals went another. And here's where they went. They went into the tomb sculpture. Uh, this is a stone sculpture of a tiger from the tomb of Emperor Wen of Chen from the Chen Dynasty, 500 AD. Absolutely magnificent. And this corresponds in terms of the apogee of the art to the Gupta period of uh, India. Uh, fantastic stuff here. Um, shamanic characters here flying on animals and so forth. Um, luminous Mahayana Buddhist art. Um, absolutely spectacular. A, a real fireworks show of this dynasty of the Northern Wei Kingdom and the Southern Lu Lusung uh, Kingdom. Um, okay, I think that brings us uh, to where I wanted to go, um, and we'll, so we'll leave it there for Toynbee's uh, chapter and my riff on it uh, of uh, Chinese uh, civilization.